is the most valuable thing you can possess. Powerful people from every century have even gone to the length of killing to obtain a masterpiece. Whoa! Oh my God! The gallery is too much of a risk. They want their money back in 48 hours, John. They accept you as the new boss. But this painting thing was, they just can't stomach it. The pink Marilyn? It's my inheritance. My father promised it to me and I want it back because it's mine. you get this? If you ask me, it looks like a five-year-old could have done it. But I want a bigger cut because I found it, all right? Tell me the truth, John. Those men were there for you. You're gonna have to trust me. No. I got a plan. It's time. I'll give him a nice walk. Oh. Where's the crazy? They're suicidal. Please, no, 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 no! Bring Meryl in, and we won't hurt her. I'm gonna give them what they want. Welcome to America. Hi, Debbie. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Well, I must congratulate you on one of the most visceral and visually vibrant films that I've seen this year. Um, this is an eye popper. Boy, oh boy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I love the story. I love your structure. But I love your visuals so much. And the fact that you keep your color focus to the three primary colors of red, yellow, and blue. And when you and much like your story, when you mix beauty with the horror of the blood and killing, you come up with something beautiful. You mix your three primary colors and you come up with new colors and something beautiful. And I love that metaphor that you've constructed visually in this film. Um, it, it, it suits neo-noir perfectly. Absolutely perfectly. You know, where did the idea for this story arise? Um, well, thank you for saying this. Um... That was actually my indication to all the heads of the department that we were just going to use primary colors everywhere unless something happens that disrupts the story. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's all yellow, blue, and, and, and red. Uh, and you only see like green when Sarah breaks up with John. And then there's violet uh, when there's a car accident. So we use the colors in a very specific way, and I, I'm glad that you liked it. Oh, I love it. I love it. But where did the idea, where did the idea for this story arise? Uh, because it goes beyond being a quote-unquote noir crime thriller. There's so much more to unpack here. So I'm curious where this came from. <laughs> it came from a lot of sources. And from personal experience, I, when I was 17, I, I was asked to be an assistant of a painter who was about to do a cycle of three frescoes in a church in Florence. 
So I spent several months on these scaffoldings, uh, 30 meters, which would be <laughs> um, 100 uh, yards, perhaps, no, 50 yards mm -hmm. up on the chair, actually hammering the, the, the drawing of the Madonna, of the Virgin Mary, on the walls and having the lights, one warm and one cold, and passing the carbon on the walls. So I had a physical encounter with art. Um, so at an early at an early age, so I, that's why I decided to set the story in the world of contemporary art. And also, I thought art as a, um, the widest sense of the term, uh, meaning um, architecture for the buildings, books, uh, sculptures, music, is actually all we have left from all the people that have lived before us. Mm -hmm. So I. Art was, um, is a sort of like an invisible chain that connects us to mankind. I, I, I love that whole concept. And you bring in, as you said, so many different types of art, uh, modernistic sculptures, your end titles. We even see Liechtenstein references in the animation. You've got so many beautiful things. And of course, I think you made a very wise decision to focus the pursuit in this film on Warhol's Pink Marilyn. Everybody knows that painting. Everybody knows that picture. <laughs> So, I mean, that it, you didn't go for something obscure or some Renaissance painter. You went with Andy Warhol, with Marilyn. Why? Why Marilyn? Because Marilyn, of course, is these vibrant pinks. So this really stands out amongst the red, yellow, and blues that you've constructed around it. Yeah. Um, just to add something to your previous question, a lot of ideas came from different sources, like um, 18th century paintings that are referred like in the pool scene mm -hmm. or visually in terms of colors. Or there's like a rainbow poem that speaks about a soldier uh, that seems to be in a beautiful valley, full, uh, really beautifully sunlit in spring uh, with the flowers blossoming. And then you, you, you realize at the end of the poem that he's dead. So a lot, and then I took inspiration from this poem to do the pool scene where in which Shaky gets taken into Michael's house, in which we see a beautiful guy laying on the pool, and then we go back and we see again the, the guy in the sunlight through the eyes of Shaky, and we see that he's actually dead. Mm -hmm. uh, so the sources are from very different sources, really, like poems, uh, paintings. And I chose the Marilyn because she was already an icon in herself, obviously, and then Andy Warhol took her and made her become something else. And on a thematic level, the movie is a reflection on pop culture and pop icons, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I, I set the first scene in a dead rock star <laughs> diner. There's dead rock stars and there's a Cadillac. These are all references to pop culture. Oh. And pop culture taken from a context and made it into something else. Yeah, you're... you're... Uh, our producer, Marco Beltrami, did... Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, your pop culture references are outstanding. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. You know... Um, the Pink Berlin, uh, it, it brings an element of chaos into everybody's life. Uh, being a stolen painting that uh, people chase. So um, I thought the, the, um, the color, it's, it's not just the colors of the Pink Marilyn, it is the colors of the Pink Marilyn, but it's also what it means in terms of iconic, as an iconic theme and in terms of pop culture. Mm -hmm. And the, the Pink Marilyn also plays into, there have been so many, that's been replicated on so many, uh, you know, coffee mugs, uh, you know, book covers, you know, print after print after print, you know, posters. Um, so it really also feeds it. It's so ubiquitous that it feeds into this idea of somebody wanting to steal it, but then it's so easy to replace the real one with a fake one. And I think that feeds really well into this story and the who done it who's got the picture i think that's very clever on your part to do that thank you and you know your cast like i was saying yeah 
No, go ahead. Go ahead, Alessio. No, I was just saying, in, in, uh, on a thematic level, the story is about a couple of themes, and one of them being the relationship between chaos and order, mm -hmm. and, and, and how art can bring an element of chaos into people's life. And, and yes, I chose a very recognizable piece because I was really reflecting on what is iconic and what is... Uh, what belongs to mankind, in a way, and what belongs to pop culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it works so well. You, know, you have an incredible cast of characters here. <laughs> We've got a mobster, a, a, a mobster son who loves art, whose father didn't think he had any talent, and he's very angry about that. And his whole obsession with scorpions... Okay, do you like scorpions? Because this is one of the most fascinating elements in this film. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I don't specifically like scorpions <laughs> myself. Uh, it, was a, it was a metaphor because um, usually the hero's journey, somebody who wants something and uh, trying to achieve that, they face some obstacles, and these obstacles transform them, and they come back home transformed and changed, and they sometimes they bring home a treasure of some kind. And I thought people never really change unless they really want to. So the journey that the characters make in this film is not a journey of transformation, because nobody changes in the film. <laughs> you know. But what they all do... What they will do is they learn to accept themselves. They accept who they are. They accept their own true nature. So Michael really wanted to be a painter, but in the end, he accepts to be the son of a mobster. Mm -hmm. John really wanted to clean up and open a gallery, but in the end, he forges the paint. And so the scorpion is a metaphor for this, for, this, for accepting your true nature. And, and this is why Michael tells the story of the scorpion and the frog. Yes. So, and that's why the, the father has a scorpion tattoo, and he also reveals that he was tattooed probably at an early age by his father. Mm -hmm. So the scorpion is a metaphor, a visual metaphor in this case, of accepting your own nature. Accepting yourself. Just accept yourself. Because I'm really curious about your work with both your cinematographer, Ben Knott, and Marco Beltrami and your score, because your music is so important here, and it really it melds beautifully with the vibrancy of the visuals. So can you tell me a little bit about that that um, meld, that visual plus, plus music, uh, creating this chaotic world that is so delicious? Thank you. That is a good question. Um, in terms of lights, we... When we were, the goal was not to uh, necessarily create um, something. It was to be uh, to go a little bit in a sort of a graphic novel direction uh, to create a world that would. Is a I want to create a world where you have never been, but you would like to go. Mm -hmm. and to create a world where. Uh, things are a little bit over the top, but yet always believable and and make the audience go on a journey to another place. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of music, we, I mean, I could obviously elaborate much more on this. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of, this, uh, of anamorphic lenses, uh, in terms of this, uh, depth of field, uh, we went for a short depth of field uh, cinematic look. We used anamorphic lenses. And then, of course, I created a, a, a specific color palette for the characters. Right. Like the clothes and, and the sets and the lights are, are white and black for Michael because he's a dark character who lives in a dark world, uh, while uh, John's world is colorful and pop. Um, and we use different lenses to do that. We use the um, uh, Zeiss lenses that are more uh, impactful on Michael's story and Cook lenses that are more soft for John's story. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of music, uh, Mark Beltrami, I was uh, blessed to work 
work with him and I, I he did sort of in music the same technique or uh, style that and the world did when he took an iconic character like Marilyn Monroe and transformed her into a painting, right? Into something else, into mm-hmm. artwork. Uh, Marco took classical uh, pieces, the uh, classical mu- uh, music cues that everyone knows, like the Ave Maria or the Chopin Nocturne, and transformed them into something else, in a sort of a contemporary version mm-hmm. of that. So we tried to do with the music the same reflection on uh, class, a class, something classical or something that belongs to popular culture that everyone knows and transform it into something else. Well, I think I, it's safe for me to say I have never seen a film where I have heard such a beautiful instrumentation of Ave Maria, almost with uh, you know very faint hypnotic bell sounds, juxtaposition next to Blondie, Heart of Glass. I think I think that's safe to say, but you know, it works in this film, Alessio. It works so well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Oh, Alessio. Um, I... yeah, we were on the same vein of going for um, these pop cultural references that I was referring to. Thank you. Well, you have melded the worlds beautifully, and I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you. Uh, I'm writing something. Ooh. Uh, I can't wait. Thank you, Alessio, so much. This has been lovely. Me too. Likewise. Thank you, Debbie. (laughs) 